Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us today for today's Wednesday webinar, Social Security Disability for Spinal Cord Injuries. My name is Caitlin Wildoner. I'm an attorney who helps disabled individuals obtain their disability benefits as quickly as possible so they can focus on getting better. <clears throat> As I mentioned today, we are going to discuss Social Security disability as it relates to spinal cord injuries, and I'm going to apologize in advance. I'm getting over allergy sickness, not sure, um, so if I'm a little hard to understand today, I do apologize. Here's our roadmap for today. We're going to start out talking about some Social Security disability basics, shift into some considerations, one potential listing as it relates to spinal cord injury, additional considerations to make, and then how an attorney can help you with your Social Security disability claim. Before we go any further, a little bit about me. As I said before, my name is Caitlin Wildoner. I am the founding attorney of Beacon Disability PLLC, which is a law firm based in Florida, where we exclusively practice federal administrative law and help clients obtain their disability benefits used at the agency level within the Social Security Administration with their SSDI and SSI matters. <clears throat> I will um, also, I, I do, I usually say this already, um, I don't answer questions on the live webinar, and I can't respond to super specific questions um, in the comments on the replay. And the reason for that is not because I don't want to help, but it's because I often need more information than what you can type out. And I don't want you putting all of that personal information out there, um, either on the, the actual webinar or um, in the comments on the replay. I just try to protect your privacy. Um, I also usually need more information, and so I can't give legal advice. Um, this webinar is not meant to be legal advice. It's just additional background information on the Social Security disability process, and specifically, as you'll see, as it relates to the listing for spinal cord injuries in a moment. So <clears throat> I, I do... Um, love to answer questions. So at the end of the webinar, there will be a slide with our phone number. Uh, I think it's got our address, our, our um, email address, and maybe our website address. Um, I will also go ahead and right now we'll drop in the chat on the live a link to schedule a consultation over the phone. Um, and that link to schedule a consultation is also going to be down below on the replay. So if you do have questions, please utilize those ways of getting in touch with us, either, like I said, through the scheduling link, our website, email address, or giving us a call directly on the phone. We are always happy to help in any way that we can. If we, for some reason, can't help, we do try to connect you um, or point you in the right direction of somebody who can. So going from there, Social Security Disability Basics. There are two different Social Security Disability programs. There's Social Security Disability Insurance, or SSDI benefits, and there's Supplemental Security Income, or SSI benefits. Both of the programs are going to require that you be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months due to one or more physical or mental impairments. Where they differ is SSDI benefits require that you have a work history. They require that you've paid into the social security system for a certain amount of time. And typically we say that's five of the last 10 years. There are exceptions to that rule, particularly for younger adults. <clears throat> Children are not eligible for SSDI benefits unless they have a parent that they can ride on the parent's um, uh, benefits. So SSDI does have work history requirements. SSI, on the other hand, has income and asset requirements. You must be below certain income and asset thresholds to qualify for SSI benefits. The income thresholds do vary depending on how many people are in the household, married, children, things like that. So I don't get into those. The asset restrictions, though, you cannot have more than $2,000 in assets if you are single and more than $3,000 in assets if you are married and qualify for SSI. <clears throat> one home and one car do not count for those assets, but anything above that does. Anything, you know, bank accounts, investment accounts, retirement accounts. Um, oftentimes with a married couple, if you have two cars, that second car is going to count towards your assets. Social Security is looking at anything that you can sell or use to pay your bills and live off of before they allow SSI to, to step in. Um, the other thing I want to mention is you do have to be disabled and unable to work for a period of at least 12 months to qualify for either program. However, 
those 12 months don't have to pass before you apply. As soon as you realize that you are going to be disabled and unable to work for 12 months, you should apply. What might happen is it might initially <clears throat> get denied because Social Security says, we don't think this is going to last 12 months. Um, for example, I, I once had a case where uh, a client went out of work for spine surgery, didn't apply for Social Security benefits right away. It was supposed to be a simple spine surgery, supposed to be you know out of work for a few months, do some rehab, get back to work. Well, after the initial spine surgery, she had to have another one and another one. She also had to have different surgeries on different body parts, shoulders, knees. Um, so she was out of work for multiple years. And of course, when you have surgery after surgery like that, your body can't function the way it used to because you're you're constantly in periods of rest and recovery and then pushing your body to get back to where it was. Um, so as soon as she realized, I think it was after the second I believe she had two spine surgeries relatively close to each other. Um, and it was after the second one that she's like, okay, I, I can't go back to work. And then it just, you know, one thing after another. Um, the I don't believe the the reasons for the two spine surgeries, one right after the other, um, were were a failure of the first. I think it was a different, different section of the spine. Um, so, anyways, all that to say. As soon as you realize <clears throat> that you're going to be out of work for 12 months, go ahead and apply. The worst thing that's going to happen is Social Security is going to look at your file and they're going to say, eh, you went out of work for a you know rotator cuff tear in your right arm, right shoulder. You'll be fine. You you know go through the surgery, go through the PT. You'll be fine in you know three months or less. Um, and if if that doesn't happen, you know of course you want to keep going through the appeals process. So um, that's just a point of clarification to make. You do have to be disabled for at least twelve months. They don't pay benefits for less than that, but you don't have to wait that twelve months before you apply. I know it's confusing. So here's the five-step evaluation process. When you first submit your application for Social Security Disability Benefits, the very first thing, step zero, that Social Security is going to do for SSI is make sure you're below the income and asset thresholds. As long as you are, you move on to the five-step evaluation. With SSDI, the very first thing they're going to do is make sure you have that work history requirement. As long as you do, you move on to this five-step evaluation. After that, the first step in the five step is, are you currently engaging in substantial gainful activity? Are you working more than 20 hours a week or earning more than $1,470 a month? If you are doing either of those, working more than 20 hours a week or earning gross earnings of $1,470 a month, Social Security will deny your claim. They will say you are engaging in substantial gainful activity. And by our definition, you cannot be found disabled. If you are not engaging in substantial gainful activity, they go to step two to look at the medical records. And there they're looking at, do you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment? If you do not have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, the case stops there. Social Security denies the claim. They say you don't have any severe impairments. You can't be disabled by our rules. A severe impairment is essentially an impairment that has a limitation on your ability to perform work-related activities. <clears throat> as long as you have at least one severe medically determinable impairment, the agency moves to step three, where they look at their blue book of listings that we'll look at in a minute for spine, spinal cord injuries. Do you meet or equal that listing? As we'll talk about in a minute, it's a very high bar. If you do meet or equal the listing, Social Security will approve it at step three. If you don't meet or equal the listing, they'll go to step four. They'll look at the medical records again. They create a residual functional capacity for you, which is what they believe you are capable of doing. They look at that RFC. They look at your past work and they say, can an individual with this RFC go back to your past work? If you can, they deny it. They say you can go back to your past work. You're not disabled according to our rules. If you cannot go back to your past work, Social Security moves to step five, where they look at any other work that exists in the national economy. And they look at your RFC. And they say, can an individual with this age, education, past work experience, and transferable skills, and this RFC, do any other job that exists in the national economy? If you can, if there are other jobs that exist, then they'll deny the case. And if there are not other jobs that exist, then they will go ahead and approve it at step five. <clears throat> so that's the five-step evaluation process. Um, sometimes people get really hung up on this and they say, oh, I definitely meet this listing. And you might. The listing is a high bar. Um, so we always try to 
encourage you to make sure that your doctors are supporting your claim by not just making sure that the objective medical evidence that's needed often for a listing is included in the file, but also if you do have restrictions that they're giving you. If they're saying you cannot lift more than 10 pounds, if they're saying that you need to sit stand, you need to be able to walk around your workstation every 10 minutes um, because your lumbar spine pain sets in, whatever it is, um, you want to make sure that they're being supportive and that they're putting that in the file because that can be really helpful. Otherwise, what it kind of happens is a he said, she said thing. You know, you're saying, well, my doctor told me I can't lift more than 10 pounds. We look at the medical records. It's nowhere in the medical records. Well, you know, you swear up and down. My doctor told me, my doctor told me, my doctor told me, which very well might be true. But unfortunately, Social Security looks at the records. They don't see the doctor telling you that. <clears throat> and there's nothing in the records that would indicate why they say that because the doctor never did any imaging. So things like that, um, you you that's that's how you can kind of help and just keep track of your medical records with the advent of um, patient portals. Now, a lot of patients can go in and see what the doctors are writing. So if the doctor is telling you, don't lift more than 10 pounds, make sure that's in your chart and make sure it's also commensurate with what you can do. Um, you know, if you're going out and, and deadlifting on the weekends and your doctor's telling you not to lift more than 10 pounds, it, it doesn't matter if it's in the chart or not, you're, you're doing it. And, and it's not a limitation that's true to you in your situation. So just be cognizant of all of that. As I mentioned, the bar to meet the listing is pretty high. And I believe our next slide will show us the listing for spinal cord injuries that social security considers as part of the neurological grouping of listings. So you can still meet and qualify for SSDI or SSI benefits if your RFC is below what your past work would require and or the RFC that you have would prohibit you from engaging in any type of substantial gainful activity. That can mean you're unable to sustain competitive employment. It can also mean if you're between the ages of 50 and 55, 55 and 60, or 60 and up, 60 to 65 really, um, it can also mean that you may meet one of the grid rules. I get clients that also get hung up on the grid rules sometimes too. Um, and, and they're a little more complex. We've done webinars on them before. Um, they are a little more complex than one may think. So, but the RFC plays right into that grid rule argument. It plays right into the argument of being unable to sustain competitive employment. And so that's why it can be helpful to have that supportive doctor to help you with that. All right, here is listing 1108, spinal cord disorders. As you can see, it is a high bar. There's three different ways to meet it, A, B, or C. You do not have to meet all three, you just need to meet one. So to meet A, you must have a complete loss of function, including a complete lack of motor, sensory, and autonomic function of the affected parts of your body for at least three consecutive months after the disorder. B is if you have disorganization of your motor function in two extremities, which will result in an extreme limitation in your ability to stand up from a seated position, to balance while standing or walking, or to use your upper extremities, again, persistent for three months. Or also persistent for three months. So as you can see, three months is a big thing here. It, all of these have to exist for three months and not only exist, but be shown in the medical records. So for example, before we move on to C, if you have a disorganization of motor function in your legs as a result of your spinal cord disorder and you cannot rise from a seated position easily, that needs to be in the medical records. <clears throat> a lot of times doctors will put in the chart, they'll note if you have a hard time getting on and off the exam table, look for that in your chart. If you have a patient portal, look for that. If you do truly have a hard time getting from the exam table back off, getting onto the exam table, Whatever it is, <clears throat> make sure that's being notated in the chart. Same with your gait, G-A-I-T, your gait. If you have a hard time walking, if you're using a cane, you're using a walker, you're using bilateral crutches, and the doctor is saying your gait is normal, it's not normal. You're using an assistive device. It needs to be put in the record and in your chart that you're using that assistive device. So those are two things sometimes that we see specifically as it relates to spinal cord disorders often um, to, to just to look for. Now, if you're not using the cane, if you don't need the cane, if it's not medically necessary, don't roll into your doctor's office with a cane just so they put it in the chart that you've got a cane. That's not how it works. Um, so if you need the cane or the walker or the assistive device, make sure you're using it and make sure it's in the chart. Um, but, you know, just having a cane is, is not going to result in a, in a favorable decision. 
<clears throat> getting back to the listing, um, 1108C, the third way to meet or equal the listing is if you have a marked limitation in your physical functioning and in one of the following areas of mental functioning, again, for three months. And the following four areas of mental functioning are your ability to understand, remember, or apply information, your ability to interact with others, your ability to concentrate, persist, or maintain pace, or your ability to adapt or manage yourself. So that is the listing. Remember, if you do not meet this based on your medical records, or even just what the doctors are telling you, what you know, what you live, what you experience, but you still believe you're disabled and unable to work, that's where the RFC is going to come in. And as long as the RFC is work preclusive, meaning you cannot work on a full-time basis, you can still qualify for disability benefits. Certain considerations, medical records are critical, okay? I keep talking about the patient portal and looking at the patient portal. That can be so incredibly helpful. But again, the medical records have to be honest. Doctors are not gonna falsify records. Um, so it's important to be honest with your doctors and that they are then putting your honest words and their honest words into your chart. The issue in disability cases is not just, can you go back to your past relevant work, but are there any jobs that exist in the national economy that you can do with your RFC if you don't meet the listing? Again, if you're 50 or older, the grid rules might apply. As I mentioned, we did do um, a webinar on the grid rules. We've, we've done a couple of them. If, if you are 50 or older, feel free to go back and look for those. Those can be very helpful. Functional capacity can be relevant and objective medical records will be important. I always, I, I kind of bookend this, this slide with medical records because they are so important. And it's not because what you say doesn't matter because it does. Um, <clears throat> the reason why is because it's objective. It's something that social security can look at and hang their hat on and say, yes, <clears throat> this has to be true because this imaging says so, because this EMG study says so. Um, and, and that can help back up the RFC about why you have certain limitations. Finally, how can an attorney help you? This is not a complete list of what we can do, um, but it is just kind of an example of some of the things that we do. We can provide guidance on what correspondence from Social Security actually means. We file necessary appeals. We review your medical records and your case file. We discuss what additional records may be helpful in your case, if that is possible. We can review your documents for accuracy and completeness, and that is because Social Security, particularly at the initial and reconsideration stages, will send out questionnaires for you to answer. And we don't answer those questionnaires for you. I like to refer to them as testimony without having to go before a judge. They are <clears throat> an opportunity for you to tell Social Security what you deal with and what you go through on a daily basis. And so that can be a very good opportunity um, and, and one that you know you should take advantage of. Like I said, we are happy to explain to you what Social Security is looking for. We're happy to review them for accuracy and completeness. Going back to, you know, if, if you're doing CrossFit every other weekend, but you're saying that, you know, you're limited to less than sedentary, that doesn't match up. Um, and if we know that you do CrossFit and you're telling Social Security that you're limited to less than sedentary, we'll say, whoa, whoa, you don't want to, you know, you've got to be honest here. Um, we work with you to provide relevant updates to Social Security throughout your claim. And then as we get updates from Social Security, we provide them back to you as well. If you have to go to hearing, we do prepare you for that hearing. And then we question you and any other witnesses, such as a medical witness or a vocational witness at the hearing. Um, as far as personal witnesses on your end, we do talk about that. If you're a client of ours, you know how um, we tend to deal with those. Um, so those, those are permitted, but we tend to deal with them in a, in a different way. And we do help you with that as well. Here's our contact information. We will go ahead and drop the link to schedule a call with us in the live chat again. That link is down below on the replay. Feel free to also give us a call, send us an email. We are always happy to help in any way that we can. And like I mentioned before, if for some reason we cannot, we do try to connect you with somebody who can. So thank you so much for joining. Thank you for being here and have a wonderful day.